Hello, this is the Radical Reviewer taking a look at Fascism and Big Business by Daniel Grimm, Pathfinder Press, 1973. The key idea of this text is that fascism grew to prominence fueled by big business. The capitalists wanted to crush the gains labor had made and to come out of the Great Depression having refloated their profits. Big business, fearful of socialist revolution, armed and funded fascism, and using state power, fascism allowed a select few to suppress the mass of working people on the capitalist's behalf. We see this today, as culturally, alt-right and neo-Nazi types call for the repression of various so-called degenerate races and sexes from the social arena, while economically, capitalists seek to maintain high profits as working class people struggle. Let's take a look at the text in depth. Forward. Grin begins the text arguing that there is only one way to bar the road to fascism, namely to overthrow capitalism. Fascism, Clara Zitkin wrote as far back as 1923, is the punishment inflicted on the proletariat for not having continued the revolution begun in Russia. Fascism could be our punishment tomorrow if we let the hour of socialism pass. And perhaps fascism will be our punishment. Like I said, we have alt-right folks on the social level calling for the repression of oppressed groups, and at the same time on the corporate end, companies try to get rid of social programs, unions, keeping wages low, and establishing a sort of fascist corporate state. Here Gurin is calling for the overthrow of capitalism. Many groups arguing for justice see overthrowing capitalism as the goal. If you are truly anti-racist, then you call for the overthrow of capitalism. If you are truly against sexism, then you call for the overthrow of capitalism, etc., etc. This is because capitalism rewards competition, and as Michael Albert argues, garbage rises. That is, to get ahead in capitalism, you're rewarded for lying, manipulating, rapacious behavior, etc., etc., rather than collaboration. And wouldn't you know it, certain people want to fight to keep the unfair social and economic advantages they receive based on their gender, race, sex, or class in capitalist society. And in this way, fascism is a more extreme form of capitalism, taking these competitive social privileges and oppressions and giving them state legitimacy. Chapter 1. Big Business Finances Fascism this chapter is about what was going on historically that led to big industry backing fascism. Grin argues, Neither in Italy nor in Germany was revolution in the offering at the moment fascism took state power. The bourgeoisie resorts to fascism less in response to disturbances in the street than in response to disturbances in their own economic system. It's not so easy, though. Grin explains the challenge capitalists face in taking back the gains made by working people. He states, the political rights which democracy grants to the masses act as a sort of safety valve and prevent violent clashes between rulers and ruled. When the feast is abundant, the people may safely be allowed to pick up the crumbs. As long as democracy survives, the masses, though thoroughly deceived and plundered, have some means of defense against the great penance. Folks who watched my last review will recognize this democracy is a safety valve argument from Chris Hedges's death of the liberal class. Grin continues, After World War I, in the two countries under consideration, it was necessary to make important concessions to the working class in order to avoid a real social revolution. Determined to take back these concessions someday, big business had the quite original idea of entrusting to armed militarized gangs the task of harassing the organized proletariat and smashing its resistance. This was the first step in taking back the gains made by working people. It was to enlist some working class people to attack the rest, just like the company goons in the early 19th century. Referring to the loss of heavy industry that World War I provided, Grin concludes, the big business interests had reached a point where only aid of the state could make their enterprises profitable again. It was up to the state to help them break working class resistance and cut wages. It was up to the state to refloat their sinking enterprises, grant them subsidies and tax exemptions, assure them great tariff protection, and keep them going with armament orders. America is on a similar path. Many corporations rely on military contracts, tax exemptions, research and development grants, etc. to function. Grin continues, by the summer of 1930, most of the great industrialists and bankers associated with them were underwriting the National Socialist Party. 
They gave it the formidable material resources that permitted it to win the electoral victory of September 1930 and gain 107 seats in the Reichstag. Like the Tea Party promoting Republicans, like the alt-right and Trump, we see capitalists and a handful of duped working-class folks clamoring to support a raise for capitalists while fighting against oppressed members of the working class in the hopes that it will help them. So we see that countries involved in World War I were making a lot of money from the war and were anticipating making a lot of money from victory. These countries had passed various social policies that helped working people. However, when the Great Depression hit, and swarms of unemployed vets were coming home angry and disillusioned, and workers were calling for socialist revolution, it became within capitalist interests to take back the gains made on behalf of working people in an attempt to crush worker rebellion and secure their profits. And then, as well as today, many of the people most vehemently calling for fascism are duped working class folks. It is as if they looked at the system as it is and said, hey, I can live better by snatching the crumbs out of the hands of minorities and various oppressed groups while ignoring the pie that the capitalists are devouring. Chapter 2. The Middle Classes, Considered as Fascism's Mass Base. This chapter is about people being duped into following fascism. Grin starts the chapter stating, The backbone of the fascist troops was the urban middle class. Like the alt-right today, or perhaps like poor whites in the South during the Civil War, Folks who might have caught a break in the current system decide to become class traitors and fight fellow workers to ensure that their ilk receive the benefit. The capitalist class achieves this subterfuge by wearing the mask of supporting the fatherland, i.e. his workshop, his property, etc. But in reality, his capital has no country. It's just a way of duping the middle classes. Grin states, Fascism, far from declaring itself in the service of the existing order, claims to seek its overthrow the better to dupe the middle classes. It professes to be anti-capitalist, even revolutionary. Like the Tea Party or the alt-right claiming to be anti-establishment, like Paul Joseph Watson saying that conservatism is the new punk, it's the capitalist establishment parading as anti-establishment. Grin continues, the capitalist bourgeoisie tries to arouse the peasant against the worker. It claims the proletarian socialist program will socialize the land and it makes the peasant tremble for his bit of soil. Like Barbara Ehrenreich's book, Fear of Falling, explains, people who have very little can be duped by the capitalist class to cling to what little they have. Then, referring to young folks of the time, Grin observes, In Germany, the economic crisis which began at the end of 1929 plunged young students and intellectuals into terrible distress. Their ruined families could no longer afford to pay for their studies, and they could not work with their hands. As for graduates, they had no hope of finding positions. Unemployment crushed the proletarian youth. Rootless and declassed, rejected by the productive process, and transformed into a parasite, the young unemployed was placed in an economic and moral position quite similar to that of the young student. This is the social situation that nurtured the rise of fascism, and this is the social situation we are in today. The text spends a chunk of time talking about the middle class and the benefits they receive from capitalism and their fear of losing it to others or oppressed groups if they're allowed to have the same benefits. Like I'd said, Barbara Ehrenreich's book Fear of Falling displays how people who fought for social gains fear losing those gains and will turn and attack compatriots to ensure they maintain their status. Like working class whites in the South during the Civil War or the alt-right today, Folks get fearful as the economy takes a downturn, as manufacturing leaves, as people work two or three jobs just to get by, as college is no longer a guarantee of employment, and fighting for a raise in the minimum wage seems hopeless. The things Germany was facing socially and economically then, America is facing now. You have upper middle class and duped working class folks fighting against feminists, minorities, attacking minimum wage workers, rather than the capitalists. Chapter 3, Fascist Mysticism, The Man of Destiny, The Fatherland. This chapter is about fascism's appeal to slogans rather than information, to grand pronouncements rather than facts, a phenomenon we definitely see today, both in the internet comment sections and from the U.S. president. In Death of the Liberal Class, Hedges states, The loss of the liberal class creates a power vacuum, filled by speculators and war profiteers, gangsters and killers, 
often led by charismatic demagogues. It opens the door to totalitarian movements that rise to prominence by ridiculing and taunting the liberal class and the values it claims to champion. The promises of these totalitarian movements are fantastic and unrealistic, but their critiques of the liberal class are grounded in truth. It is in this way that Grin explains the mysticism involved in fascism. The fascists are shown to rely on faith, mysticism, charisma, etc., rather than facts. We see this today with Trump and the alt-right's blatant abuse of facts in favor of rhetoric and mass appeals. Grin then talks about the several ways the fascist message was able to take root, namely through the widespread use of automobiles, planes, loudspeakers, radio, symbols, repetition. And how is fascism taking root today? YouTube channels, memes, etc. used by the alt-right to spread fascist propaganda. Grin argues that socialists, on the other hand, thought that they would win popular support through newspapers, articles, books, calm, detailed arguments, which were drowned out by the hype of fascism, sloganism, and mass appeals. Chapter 4. Fascist Demagogy Anti-Capitalist Capitalism Again, like Paul Joseph Watson saying conservatism is the new punk, this chapter is about fascism as anti-establishment establishment. Grin argues, that fascism's game is to call itself anti-capitalist without seriously attacking capitalism. Grin goes on to explain that it was foreign capitalists that the fascists would attack, while allowing nationalist capitalism to flourish. It might be difficult to find a parallel to this today, but perhaps there is something in folks on the right calling every illegal immigrant, refugee, or asylum seeker, framing them as all rapists and killers and drug dealers and terrorists, etc. Grin then talks about the promises made by the fascists to their supporters to get them on board, namely that they will no longer be proletariat, that small manufacturers and merchants will be protected, and that the corporate state will give a voice to the producers and the tradesmen. This is essentially the argument we currently see from folks on the right, that by keeping minorities and women oppressed and getting rid of social services and getting rid of taxes, small businesses will thrive, when in reality we see something very different. Grin continues, Fascist demagogy draws simultaneously on the reactionaries and the reformists. From the former, it borrows the idea of resurrecting the medieval artisans and small merchant guilds. From the reformist, it takes the idea of the corporation based on class collaboration and the notion of consultative economic parliament. Similarly, when watching alt-right YouTube videos or public speeches, it seems that they ask for both a return to the fictitious 50s with great job opportunities, white Anglo-Saxon nuclear families, etc. And yet they also talk about preserving a utopian future where the deviant hordes of social justice warriors, feminists, minorities, etc. have all been defeated. Chapter 5, Fascist Strategy on the March to Power. This chapter is about the capitalist and state support of fascist goon squads. Grin argues, the fascist gangs have the character of anti-labor militia, entrusted by the capitalist magnates and country landlords with the mission of harassing the organized proletariat and destroying its power of resistance. Those familiar with my review on Daniel Fussfield's The Rise and Repression of Radical Labor recognize this method of suppression. This is the capitalist method of letting working class folks loyal to them, in this case namely fascists, suppress other workers on behalf of the capitalists. Grin then gives several examples of fascists killing labor leaders and various other opponents to fascism, and yet those murderers in question are given only a slap on the wrist or simply set free. Michael Parenti, in a lecture titled The Sword and the Dollar, and the corresponding book of the same name, gives excellent examples of this in our modern day, of right-wing, murderous groups receiving very little punishment by the capitalist government, while these governments do nothing to the social justice groups receiving harassment and assassinations. Grin states, the police recruited for the squadrons, urging outlaws to enroll in them and promising them all sorts of benefits and immunity. The police loaned their cars to squadron members and rejected applications for arms permits by workers and peasants while extending the permits granted to fascists. It is crucially important to keep this in mind when we see police, media, and the government respond to something like Occupy Wall Street or Black Lives Matter or Antifa and compare that response to alt-right and neo-Nazi protests. And the liberal response at the time sounds like the liberal response now. As fascist gangs were assassinating labor leaders in the streets, Grin states, let us be careful not to reply to fascist violence. The reformist leaders said, 
both in Italy and Germany, we should arouse public opinion against us. Above all, let us avoid forming combat groups and semi-military bodies, for we should risk antagonizing the public authorities, who, we are confident, will dissolve the semi-militant groups of fascism. Ugh, liberals, you get the bullet too. Uh, just, just kidding. Grin states, the truth is that on the eve of fascism's victory, both in Italy and Germany, the labor movement was profoundly weakened and demoralized, not only because of unemployment, not only because of repeated defeats that came from want of bold tactics in the daily clashes with fascist bands, but chiefly because the union organizations had been unable to defend the gains won by the working class. Grin then quotes Mussolini at length. What are our opponents doing, Mussolini mocked in the chamber? Are they calling general strikes or even partial strikes? Are they organizing demonstrations in the streets? Are they trying to provoke revolts in the army? Nothing of the sort. They restrict themselves to press campaigns. This serves as a lesson on what should be done for attacking fascists. We should argue, as Mischief Brew in the song Fight Dirty argues, no more food. Chapter 6, The Rise and Fall of the Fascist Plebeians. This chapter is about fascism dealing with its working class adherents once victory was secured. Gurren starts the chapter stating, Fascism has won power. Its financial backers have obtained their objectives, the annihilation of parliamentary democracy, the extermination of the proletarian organizations, and the formation of an authoritarian state through which they can impose their will and raise their profits. This is fascism's ultimate goal. Yes, fascism wants racial and sexist repression, but ultimately it wants economic repression. Grin explains that political parties that were not fascist were dissolved, and attempts to revive other parties was met with a 20-year prison sentence. Grin then talks about how working-class fascists expected more economic reform and were even demanding a second revolution, which the capitalists didn't like. He states, they did not change their political staff in order to entrust the defense of their interests to agitators and demagogues. The specter of a second revolution haunts them. They demand that the most unruly plebeians be eliminated ruthlessly. Basically, as I said earlier, the working class people fighting on the capitalist behalf were quickly put out to pasture when victory was certain. The working class people who fought on behalf of the capitalist class expected bigger crumbs than what they got, and the capitalists had no interest in appeasing them. Like the Dead Kennedy lyric from Nazi Punk's Fuck Off, in the real Fourth Reich, you'll be the first to go. In the fascism of the 20th century, in the fascism of the 21st century, the capitalists used their duped working class adherents as a battering ram against their fellow working class compatriots, and when the dust settles, the capitalist so-called allies are left with nothing, just like everyone else. Chapter 7, The Real Fascist Doctrine. This chapter discusses fascism's anti-democratic and violent tendencies. Grin quotes Mussolini, who stated, For the fascist, everything is in the state, and nothing human or spiritual exists or has value outside of the state. Now, of course, we don't see this in our modern alt-right folks, as far as the state goes, but we do see a fetishization of patriotism. Everything within the U.S. military, white nationalism, men's rights, etc. is permissible, and everything outside of that framework is degenerate, and an echo chamber is formed. Grin states, A time comes when the bourgeoisie can save its threatened profits only by exterminating the proletarian organizations and governing through terror. Then it digs up the old notions of barbaric epochs, it rehabilitates violence and adopts reactionary apologists of violence as its authorities. As Hedges warned in Death of the Liberal Class, we see a hatred for democratic institutions, a hatred for the media and social movements, Trump's cries of fake news, men's rights activists calling for ethics while spewing harassment, the alt-right trying to silence the social forum on college campuses and online, and we see it historically, like in Shea's Rebellion or the rise in repression of radical labor, Capitalists prefer to be nonviolent and use democracy as a safety valve, but when workers demand a fair shake, the capitalists will kill to protect their profits. Chapter 8. 
Fascism in Power, Taming the Proletariat. This chapter continues the conversation on fascism dealing with the working class. Grin states, to forestall all labor conflicts, it exercises compulsory arbitration. That is to say, it disguises the employer's wishes as arbitrative decisions. And anyone contesting these decisions is considered an enemy of the state. We saw this with Bush's draconian efforts under the guise of, you're either with us or with the terrorists. And we see this today as well. Protests against imperialist wars or protests against imperialist capitalism are seen as attacks against America. Grin goes on to explain that the fascist unions had little support when calling for strikes, and that violence only took them so far. But when the union leaders were replaced with fascist leaders and union property was given to the fascist unions, the state and capitalist power succeeded in giving power to the fascist unions. Essentially, violence, destruction of property, and public support could only get the fascist unions so far, when communist unions were so much more popular. But when state and capitalist aid came in on the side of the fascist unions, the fascist unions won out. Like I said before, this is reminiscent of the rise and repression of radical labor, where capitalists tried to break the back of labor with both violent goon squads and by starting company-friendly unions. Chapter 9, Fascism in Power, Economic Policy. This chapter is about the cost of getting failing capitalists back on their feet. Grin starts the chapter arguing that, the fascist state is not satisfied with reducing the workers to slavery and making a general massacre of wages possible. It restores capitalist profits in another way, through various economic expedients. Grin continues, Only the great capitalists continue to draw their profit, while the economy as a whole is paralyzed, and individuals of every class are ruined or put on short rations. We see this now, as fictitious capital is refloated with bailouts and loans, and the rest of us are left stranded in one jobless recovery after the other. Grin then quotes Mussolini at length as he argues that the state is incompetent and that state functions should be undertaken by private industry. Similarly, then and today, all attacks on social programs are argued as being state incompetence or encouraging shiftlessness. Christian Prunty gives an excellent explanation of the capitalist system's reasons for attacking social welfare programs in a discussion on his book, Lockdown America. It essentially goes as follows. The more desperate and needy you are, the more you need a job. You need to work, and you will accept worsening conditions or wages. On the other hand, if you have sufficient social services, sufficient discretionary income, perhaps you won't take that cut in pay. Perhaps you will work fewer hours or be less desperate for a job. And so, the capitalists seek to destroy social programs that benefit working people. Grin then talks about the fascist government providing long-term loans, public works projects, and extensive rearmaments to get private industry back on its feet. And he states, As for the middle classes, the very one whose discontent put fascism in power, they are simply bled white. Big capital profits soar under the fascist regime, and middle class folks paid the price. Price cuts were demanded and enforced by black shirts. Big department stores could afford the price cuts, and small merchants could not. And of course we see this today, as the Occupy movement or other groups asking for simple social programs get the jackboot, while corporations get Wall Street bailouts. Chapter 10, Fascism in Power, Agricultural Policy. This chapter is, of course, about fascist agricultural policy. Grin argues, The fascist state helps the landowners exploit their workers. The agricultural laborers are deprived of their independent unions. Fixed hours of labor are no longer guaranteed. Medieval forms of exploitation are imposed on them. They are excluded from unemployment insurance, and their wages are cut below the subsistence level. And so we see fascism's adherents and opponents among the working class were equally crushed for the benefit of capitalists. Conclusion, some illusions that must be dispelled. Grin warns, the moment the working class allowed the fascist wave to sweep over it, a long period of slavery and impotence begins. A long period during which socialists and even democratic ideas are not merely erased from the base of public monuments and libraries, but what is more serious are rooted out of human brains. Grin continues, explaining that young people and workers no longer attended meetings, read labor papers, or discussed or understood socialism or communism. 
this is a turning off of critical thinking, and we see it now. People who think Anita Sarkeesian is going to destroy America, the Antifa protesters are going to destroy America, that refugees are all terrorists, and that immigrants are all drug dealers. As Chris Hedges argues in Death of the Liberal Class, the shutting off of rational debate and adherence to a charismatic leader who favors sloganism rather than facts spells the death for leftism. Grin states, in conclusion, any anti-fascism is a frail illusion if it confines itself to defensive measures and does not aim to smash capitalism itself. In conclusion, there are many things that separate the appeals of fascism in the 20th century than those of the 21st century. For example, today it is commonly understood that Nazis and fascism is bad. Uh, or, or maybe it's not so simple. What makes this text important to examine today is that it explains what was going on socially and economically that led to fascism's rise to power, namely big businesses' fear of worker rebellion, large bouts of unemployment, social justice movements, college students and other folks left with crippling debt and no promise of employment. In other words, the fears and frustrations and struggles that led to the rise of fascism then are extremely present in Western society today. If you're interested in fascism, who funded its rise and why, what was its appeal to capitalists or to workers, what did it achieve? If you want to understand the threats we face today with modern fascism, then I recommend Daniel Guerin's Fascism and Big Business. If you're interested in radical theory, looking for a book recommendation or whatever, you can get your radical book reviews here with the Radical Reviewer. Thanks for watching.